us to the book of uh, uh, the book of Matthew, the ninth chapter. It's going to talk about patching. Say patching. It's going to talk about patching. The young kids can be excused. I'm sorry, children. You you can go to children's church right now, and you can also help us pack these bags too. <laughs> you're not you're not too small, and you're not too old. Amen. Say patching. Say patching. Jesus is going to talk about patching old clothes in the ninth chapter of the gospel according to Matthew. And around the 14th verse, he's going to talk about patching old clothes. Say patching. Old clothes. When he talks about this in the 14th chapter, he is actually very relevant for today because the truth of the matter is, I see a lot of young people wearing clothes with patches. In fact, some of their clothes look like the clothes that I used to give away and throw in the garbage with holes, stretch marks. Faded. If you grew up in my household, you would have hated that style. Because I grew up in a household where we had nine children, and my mother had nine children in ten years. And I was the seventh child. And Mama would get brand new clothes for the oldest one, the oldest son, Ricky. And it would be passed down to Walter. It would go down to Robert, this, this new suit, this new pair of pants. It would go down to Philip, and ultimately it would get to me. And by the time those clothes got to me, that which was blue is now gray. <laughs> that which was black is now white. That which had no holes in it, now it are filled with holes. And so I have to say to you that I have a problem with wearing these, this new style where you have patches, you know. They, they buy these new jeans and they already have patches on them. They look old. They look raggedy. And so I would not be comfortable in that kind of a setting because of how I was raised in a time when we had to just make do. Is there anybody here who is living on a make do philosophy? Making ends meet when there are no resources to make the ends meet. Jesus is going to talk about patching, patching. In the 14th verse of that ninth chapter, the Bible said that then the disciples of John came to him asking him a question. Why do we and the Pharisees fast? Say fast. But he says, your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them. Can they? But the days will come, and I'm reading out of the New American Standard Bible, but the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Say fast. fast. And here comes a parable. Here comes a parable. Here comes a parable. They want to know, why do the Pharisees and we who are the disciples of John the Baptist fast? In fact, some of the disciples of Jesus came from John the Baptist's disciples. And they said, we want to ask a sincere question. Why do we fast? The Pharisees, the religious leaders fast, and your disciples do not fast. Why is it that we observe the things of the past and the traditions of the past and your disciples do not? Why is it that we've been, we've been doing this thing for thousands of years and all of a sudden, 
your disciples have discarded this thing called fasting. They are doing prayer, but they're not doing fasting. Say fasting. And what Jesus does is he tells, he uses this illustration to show forth a parable. Say a parable. A parable is an earthly story that has a heavenly meaning, and Jesus was very good at telling stories or telling parables, you know. It amazes me how he would take common things and common thoughts and turn them into spiritual uh, emphasis and have spiritual meanings. And in the case of parables, he would tell a story and say, this is what it means. He told a story in another place about the bridegroom and, 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 and the wedding party coming at a particular time. And he says that there are some wise versions and some foolish versions. There are some wise women and there are some foolish women. And he says that what they did in their days, they waited at nighttime until the bridal party came and they had lamps that were ready to light up the pathway for the bridal party. And, 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 and he says that they would have oil in their lamps waiting for the bridal party to come. The groom and the bride and the bridal party. And he said the foolish uh, women did not have oil in their lamp. But the wise had oil in their lamp so that they could light up the pathway for the bridal party. And then he suggests behind that that we as Christians are to have our oil lamps ready to light up for the groom, if you will. We've got to be ready at all times. And so he just tells constantly, constantly tells all kinds of stories. He told a story about a, about a farmer. He watched a farmer who threw certain kinds of seeds out onto certain kinds of soil. And he saw how those certain kinds of seeds produced in certain kinds of soil. Some soil was good. Some soil was bad. And then he turns around and says that God plants his seed, his kind of life-giving uh, empowerment inside of us and yet still it does not always sprout up the way it ought to sprout up because there's nothing wrong with the sower there's nothing wrong with the seed but there is something wrong with we the ground I wish I had a witness in the house and here he's going to tell a parable about patches he says no one in verse 816 say no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment for the patch pulls away from the garment and a worse and a worse tear say a worse tear a worse tear occurs he says that you have misunderstood what I've come to do I wish I had a witness Larry I have not come here to patch up lies Y'all get this later on. I have not come here, say I've not come here, to patch up lives. I have not come here to piecemeal lives. You see, you're thinking about the Old Testament and the traditions of the Old Testament and the Old Covenant, but there's now a new, if you will, boy on the block. His name is Jesus. And he does not patch up lives. You see, some people come to church and all they want God to do is fix certain areas of their lives. And as long as he's fixing certain areas of their lives, they're okay. They only want patch up work. And what God says through Jesus Christ, I have not come to patch up anything, but I've come to make everything new. I have not come to piecemeal your life and to handle this part of your life and that part of your life, but I've come here to make all things new. Say all things new. I have not come here, uh, I've not come here to reform anything, but I've come here to transform. The problem with too many people is that they come in and they go out the same way they come in. Hold up for a minute. They come in and they go out the same way that they come in. And they've never been made new. The Bible says that when you become, when you become a part of the Christian followhood, when you become an ambassador to Jesus Christ, God makes you brand new. He says, 
I am trying to create new creation. Behold, all things old are passed away. He doesn't want to patch us up. He just doesn't want us to pacify us, but rather he wants to make us new. Say new. He's trying to transform us. He says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you want to know how to get attached to God now? Nicodemus, you must be, I wish I had a witness, born again. Just turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you ought to be like the old folk used to say. Say, neighbor, you ought to be like the old folk. The old folk used to say, I looked at my hand. And they look new. I looked at my feet. And they did too. He put clapping in my hands. Now I'm clapping where I used to didn't clap. Now I'm praising God where I didn't really know how to praise God. Now I'm thanking God like never before. Because he's put a song in my heart. He's made me brand new. You ought not to go out the same way you came in. You ought to be shifted and changed because the Lord has made you brand new. He says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Can I help somebody? You need to write this down. Say, neighbor, God is not trying to mend you. You ever hear that song talking about he wants to mend my broken heart? He doesn't want to mend your broken heart. He wants to replace your broken heart. He doesn't want to mend your destiny. He wants to change your destiny. He doesn't want to make you over. He wants to remake you from top to bottom, bottom to top. He wants to fix you up and make you brand new. The text says you are a new creation. And so he says to he says to these disciples, your question is good, it is sincere, but at the end of the day, I'm not here to patch up things. I'm here to start things all over again. That's why he dies on Calvary. It talks about he when he dies on Calvary, it's about a new start. It's a new Beginning, He doesn't want to fix you. He wants to create you into a new creation. If you still have the same thoughts and doing the same thing you've been doing for the last 40 years, you need to ask yourself the question whether or not you've been born again. If you're still using the same curse word you've been using for the last 25 years, you need to ask the question whether or not you've been... If you're still counting sheep at night instead of counting on the shepherd, you need to ask yourself the question. If you're not walking by faith and not by sight and you got to see everything, you need to ask yourself the question, have you been born again? If you're still treating people the same kind of way you've been always treating people, you need to ask the question whether or not you've been born again. If you don't like coming to church on Sunday morning, I wish I had a witness. I don't know how anybody who's been born again won't stop by the Father's house on Sunday morning. If you've been born again, if you are a child of God, if something has happened on the inside, it ought to express itself on the outside. You ought to love God's house. You ought to love God's song. You ought to love God's praise. If you don't like praising the Lord, you're probably in the wrong house. But if you've been born again, if something has happened to you, if God has changed your life, if God has renewed your mind and you now have this mind in you that is in Christ Jesus, there ought to be a shift in your life. Have I got a witness in the house? I looked at my hands, praise God. They look new. They started to shoot in different kinds of direction now. I didn't just hold my hands to the side, but now I lift up my holy hands unto the Lord. I looked at my hand, they look new. I looked at my feet and now I'm starting to run to places that I didn't know. I'm starting to shout, I'm starting to, I got a little bounce to my. I I see y'all not ready for this. Born again. Some of us are like that pig. An owner brought in brought his pig into his house. He washed her up. He bathed the pig. He put some new clothes on the pig. He combed the pig's little hair. 
he even put a ribbon on top. And then he sprayed the little pig, the little pig with perfume, set the pig in a chair, and even crossed the piggy's legs. And he was so proud of the piggy. And the moment that he opened up the door, the pig ran and jumped back into the mud pool. That's what has happened to some of us. The moment the door is open, we go back where we came. And so Jesus says, I have not come. Bring me down. I have not come to reform. I have not come to repair. I have come with a new thing. I am doing a new thing. Those of you who are biblical scholars, he basically says to them, you don't have to worry about rituals anymore. You don't have to worry about bringing certain kinds of sacrifices. You don't have to worry about going to the priest to get to God the Father. But I'm doing a new thing. I'm opening up total new access to you. I'm going to die on the cross. You don't need the priest to come to the Father. You can go to the Father yourself. And, and once you become new, say new. Come on, let's stand on our feet. Say new. Once you become new, You've got a new nature. You've got a new life. You've got a new mind. You sitting up here worrying about what's going on in the White House. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent. All these things are going to pass away. And so what he says is, once you're new, say, once I'm new, I got to live with a new purpose. You see, in the past, before you were saved, you did not know why you were ever brought on planet Earth. And some of us toiled and toiled until we got, we got old. And then once we get old, we don't even understand our purpose. And so what do we say? We say, I done did all my work earlier in life. And so now I'm going to sit down and let the young people take over and do their thing. In other words, what we do when we get old too often we are just waiting to die. Is that life? No, that's not life. But once we know Jesus, life is no longer the same. We live to serve him. Say serve him. To serve this present age, my calling to fulfill. Oh, may all my power to engage, to do my master will. That's our purpose, to serve God through people. The Bible says we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Who are we? We are ambassadors to Jesus Christ. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, your life has purpose. You are an ambassador according to 2 Corinthians 5.20. You are an ambassador. Say ambassador. You're like the late, you're like uh, rather Ambassador Andrew Young when he was the ambassador to a nation. You are an ambassador. And when you are an ambassador, watch this, you already know the president's mind or you already know the king's mind. You are not to be asking what is the king thinking. You ought to know the king's thinking. Does the king want to make a way out of no way? Yes. Does the king want to be uh, a doctor in a sick room? Yes. Does the king want to bless you and me? Yes. Does the king love me? And does the king love you? Yes. You are an ambassador. You ought to know what the king wants. So often the king goes, the ambassador goes across to another nation and they ask the question, what does the president think? And that ambassador can answer them right away. When somebody asks you, does God love the world? You ought to be able to say, yes, for God so loved the world. That he gave his only because will God abandon me in my sickness? No, you don't have to ask the you don't have to ask the king of the God. You ought to know that God made a promise I would never leave you nor forsake you. You ought to know the king's mind. What is the king wanting for political folk? He says to do right and to love mercy and to do that which is justice 
Say, know the mind's king. Say, know the mind of this king. Secondly, you ought to, as an ambassador, stay in constant contact with your king. Oh, yeah, I know what you just said. You said, well, I'm here on Sunday morning. You say, when there's a special program like Wednesday, I'll be here for the revival. You ought to stay in constant contact with the king. You cannot know the mind of the king if you're not staying in constant contact with the king. What does that mean? That means I'm reading my Bible. The Bible is where God speaks to me. Prayer is where I speak to God. So I'm doing pretty good in speaking to God and asking God and talking to God. But I ain't doing so good in hearing from God. You got to stay in constant contact so that when the world gets on fire, when there's threat of nuclear warfare, when there's threat of a germ warfare, when there's a threat of destruction in the nation, you'll be able to say, I'm all right because I know the mind of God. At the end of the day, Jesus Christ is coming back and he's going to clean all this mess up. Thirdly, you got to keep your heart set on the king's interests. Why are you living here? I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to ask that question, but why are you here? I'm here as an ambassador to represent the interests of God. Are you with me? If he gives me a job or a business, it's not my business. I want to do it as if God is doing it himself. If, 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 if the pastor asked me to stay 20 or 30 minutes longer, that's the interest of the king. Because the king wants somebody to be fed in the next month or so. That's the interest of the king. When I wake up in the morning, I'm not thinking about where I want to go and what I want to do. I'm thinking about what God wants me to do and how can I push his interest. Have, you got, have I got a witness? I go around and I shake folk hand because the Bible says we are the fellowship, the koinia of God. And I'm representing God's fellowship and interest. Can I tell you something else? The money I got, it don't belong to me. The Bible says everything belongs to God. The cattle upon a thousand hills belong to God. What's on the hill, under the hill, and around the hill, it's all belong to God. And so since it's God's money, I got to protect it. As if it is God's money, because at the end of the day, it's not about the 10%, it's about the 90% also. I wish I had two witnesses that would shout for a moment. An ambassador represents God. An ambassador represents God. You know, when Ambassador Young used to put on his suit and go across the nation to represent the president and all of that kind of a thing, uh, and then he was going into foreign soil. Uh, he didn't just wear any old kind of suit or clothes. He wore the best. And believe you me, these patch up clothes today, don't be judgmental. They are the best. They cost two or three hundred dollars. That's why everybody don't have them. He or she walks with integrity. You don't walk around like this. and complain about everything. Oh, how you doing today? Oh, my back's hurting, my legs hurting, my knees hurting, my head hurting. I'm just hurting all over. We're just like that man that went to a doctor and said to the doctor, doctor, I got a problem. He says, what's wrong? He said, I'm hurting everywhere, all over. He said, everywhere? He said, yes, everywhere. He says, huh, that's very strange. He said, touch your head. He touches it. He said, ouch. He said, touch your nose. He touched your nose. Oh. He said, oh. He said, touch your lips. Oh. He said, touch your hands. He said, oh my God, I'm hurting. He said, just touch your leg. He touched his legs. Oh. And the doctor looked at him and said, foo, ain't nothing wrong with your body. You got a dysfunctional finger. <laughs> Represent him well in your walk. Your talk. You are not to be complaining all the time. God is bigger than your problem. God has made a way out of no way. God has given you one more sunny day. 
You're a, you may not be feeling the best, but thank God you have a reasonable portion of health and strength. Thank God you're still in your right mind. Thank God you still got shelter over your head. You still got a place to stay. You got a place to lay your head at nighttime. Your children have not died. God is bigger than your problem. So everything that comes out of our mouth ought to be a praise to God. We ought to thank God we woke up this morning. We ought to thank God we had a car to drive here today. We ought to thank God we got out of the car. We ought to thank God we still have a church that we can call our own church. We ought to thank God. Folks showed up. Walk. Say walk. And talk like you're representing God on your job. Hold your head up high. And you represent God on your job. Have I got a witness? You represent God in your family. That's your purpose. You are an ambassador, say ambassador. And then be ready for God whenever he's ready to call you in a moment's notice to do something. I just called you in a moment's notice. For this world and all it contains will pass away. You're not going to live here forever. I know you want to. But this is just the dressing up place. This is just the pass through place. You're going to go to another place after this earth. And one day this earth is going to be destroyed. The Bible says it's going to be destroyed by mankind. And God is going to see this thing and he's going to, I wish I had some revelation people, and he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Listen to me. The story is told of the Lee Steamboat Company carrying a cargo of salt pork from New Orleans to Memphis. As that steamboat passed the halfway mark, another boat attempted to pass that Lee Stem Steamboat. And the race was on. The Lee Steamboat captain ordered full steam ahead, but it was not good enough to pass the smaller little boat. Then the captain got an idea. He ordered that some of the salt pork cargo that he was carrying be thrown into the furnace. Instantly, thick black smoke came billowing out and the boat increased its power. This worked so well that they tried it again and again and they kept putting the salt pork inside of the engine. At last, when with the whistles blowing and flags waving, the Lee steamboat arrived in the port of Memphis far ahead of its rival boat. But at last, when the merchants came for their cargo of pork, they found that it had all been destroyed in the furnace to win the race they had gotten rid of, by accident, all the pork. All right, this may be corny. Pork is where you get bacon from. The problem with the steamship was that the steamship didn't bring the bacon home. At the end of the day, God is going to ask you, did you bring the bacon home? Did you bring a life for him home? Did you bring a witness for him home? Did you bring works for him home? Did you bring the bacon home? Did you represent me every day you woke up in the morning? Did you walk and talk in the spirit of God? Did you look like you were a saved individual? Did you help somebody as you travel? Did you bring the bacon home? As every head is bowed real quick. Got to bring the bacon home. Would you pray this prayer with me? Say, dear God, forgive me for not being the kind of ambassador that you have asked me to be all the time. Remind me of 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. And would you say this? Say, God, I don't want to be a patched up work for you. Say, I want to be new. Say, God, I cannot put a new patch 
on old clothes because it will stretch the old clothes and even the new clothes. Say, God, I want to be brand new from this day forward. I want to live for you. I want to work for you. I want to run for you. I want to smile for you. I want people to say that when the king is not present physically, they can look at my life and say, there is the representative of the king. Would you pray this? Say, dear God, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins, for going to the grave in my stead, but also rising up from the grave with all power. I love you, Lord. I adore you, and I worship you even today. Now take the person by the hand next to you real quick. Could you just start praying for that person? All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we are new, new creations. And God is trying to get rid of some old stuff inside of us. And God knows all of us have some old stuff that is making us stuffy. And God wants to resurrect a new person. If you're here today, you said that prayer. All you have to accept the fact that you have been accepted into the kingdom of God. And then all you have to do is believe in that sinner's prayer that we just talked about. Once you believe in that sinner prayer, all you have to do then is to give your life publicly to the Lord. Everybody that Jesus called, he called them out publicly. He told them to come forth. You can be baptized afterwards and get on that road of purpose. You don't have to worry and ask yourself the question, what is my purpose in life? God will reveal that to you so quickly. You'll turn around and say, I feel empowered now that I have a reason for living. If you're old today and you've sat back and said, I'm not doing anything else, you need to repent that to God right now. Because the moment that you get to the point that you don't have anything else to do, you will not be standing where you're standing. God will take you on home and say, you're right. There's nothing else for you to do. But I've seen 80-year-old people and 90-year-old people so excited about the Lord and doing things in his kingdom. If you're here today, you've made that confession. If you fill out that card that's right there in the rack right in front of you, We'll take that card and you put it inside the offering tray and we'll make sure that you get baptized. We'll make sure you get discipled. We'll make sure you're prayed for. We'll make sure that you're even connected to a ministry, even today. Amen. In Jesus' name, bless these who have made that prayer confession now and even bless this.